Uh, I noticed that the, my audience has dwindled down a little, at least, to what I what I consider a hardcore group. Okay, <laughs> and uh, just looking at the at the people who have shown up today, uh, I can sense that you already know quite a little bit of macroeconomics and uh, have studied it. And I'm going to take advantage of that uh, during this uh, period because I'm going to present uh, several different uh, analytical apparatuses that uh, you'll probably recognize, but that I won't have time to explain in full, although I'll say a few things uh, in order to anchor my own thoughts into the various uh, pieces of analysis I look at. Uh, so I would invite you during the uh, lecture, uh, if, if, if something is uh, totally bizarre and you don't understand what in the world is on the screen, uh, you can uh, speak up and uh, ask questions about it. Um, the uh, program announces this le lecture as extensions and applications of Austrian macroeconomics, and uh, I take that to be pretty open-ended. It allows me to do several different things. And uh, what I think is uh, helpful to do and kind of fun to do is uh, something similar to what uh, I did yesterday. If you, if you attended my lecture yesterday, uh, what you can see that we, we, we looked at Keynesian theory and uh, eventually showed what modifications were necessary to get it to morph into Austrian theory. And in my view, that's a good way of understanding both Keynesian theory and, uh, and Austrian theory. And I want to do something very similar uh, today for uh, monetarism. And it's even a little more fun because uh, I can actually draw on some of Friedman's own uh, theories, uh, and uh, which causes us to wonder why isn't he... Uh, sympathetic with the Austrians. I don't know. I think that uh, there's, uh, there's still a big question in my mind. I have some, some hints about it. Uh, but also in this lecture, uh, I want to point out what I call the many faces of monetarism. It's not quite a coherent uh, whole, uh, partly because uh, monetarism is virtually framework independent. I use that phrase in my book. That uh, is a fairly narrow doctrine having to do with the quantity of money and the overall level of prices. And once it gets beyond that basic relationship, uh, it can bring in all sorts of uh, aspects of the economy, many of which are not consistent one with the other. So we'll take a look at that too. Now, along the way, I do hope uh, also to give Friedman his due. Uh, I think that uh, we owe a lot to Friedman for some of the positive contributions he has made, and I'll try to point those out. So we'll start out uh, in that direction, actually, uh, the many faces of monetarism. Uh, and uh, Friedman's monetarism, which really uh, is a very narrow monetarism, especially when the monetarists are in a defensive mode. When, they, when they're defending their theories, they defend a fairly narrow uh, theory. Uh, and it, it's anchored to this equation of exchange, something that predates uh, Friedman by many decades, but Friedman is uh, to be credited for, for reviving it and, and for using it uh, as uh, a counter to the Keynesian doctrine, which had become dominant at the time that uh, Friedman launched his monetarist counter-revolution. Monetarist counter-revolution dates to the mid-50s, 1956 or so, when a seminal article by Friedman was published. So you, you've seen this equation before uh, in my earlier lectures. Uh, MV equals PQ, quantity of money times its velocity of circulation, is equal to the overall price level times the real output in the economy. Uh, and according to Friedman, uh, with a mild upward trend in velocity, about which more later uh, on an empirical level, uh, and output growing slowly, uh, then the price level P moves with the money supply M. And of course, in one sense, it's a matter of arithmetic, a matter of the, of the algebra. If you look at if, if V is constant or nearly so, and Q is constant or nearly so, then any movements in M and P have to be together. Okay. Uh, I say a slight upward trend, but I'll show it here as constant or near constant, which allows for the slight upward trend. Quantity is constant or near constant, allowing for the uh, slow growth, uh, and then we get the relationship not only that M and P move together, uh, but when M goes up, P goes up. In other words, the uh, direction of causation is from M to P. That's, that's also an integral part of the 
uh, Friedman's monetarism. And strangely enough, uh, I think even strange to Friedman himself and almost implausible to the uh, beginning student, it takes a long time. Okay, So there's a lag there of about 18 or 30 months. And that, as we'll see later on, gives, gives the Austrians uh, an end. It, it allows the Austrians to show what's going on uh, between that 18, or during that 18 to 30 months, uh, which looks much more Hayekian than it does uh, Friedmanian. Okay, uh, so this this is uh, Friedman's monetarism, and the only framework here, of course, is uh, is the equation of exchange. Uh, also, uh, the lion's share of the empirical work that was done during the late fifties and throughout the sixties. Uh, in the monitor's workshop at Chicago and, and at universities uh, in later years that were uh, populated by Chicago graduates. Uh, studies in monetarism were empirical studies and uh, they all took a similar form and that is that showing that in a particular time period and in a particular country the velocity of money didn't change very much uh, which is another way of saying the demand for money doesn't change very much. Uh, the amount of money people tend to hold, given their incomes and wealth levels, remains pretty stable. Uh, that's what's indicated by uh, constant velocity. Uh, and uh, I, I have attended uh, workshops. Uh, I was a guest at the uh, University of Chicago at one time and another one at uh, Stanford, uh, Stanford University at one time. Uh, and, uh, and the people working on the monetary uh, theory at, at the time but it were, we're explaining what they were doing, and we go around the table and who's doing what. And in virtually every instance, uh, after about the third or fourth uh, graduate student explained what he was doing, the next one would just name the country and name the time period. And you knew what he was doing. He was looking at the money supply uh, during that period. He was looking at, uh, at the other statistics and, and, and showing that the velocity of money uh, didn't change much uh, during that period. So that, that, that's what it amounted to. Uh, so the focus, the empirical focus, was on the demand for money. Now, uh, it's not hard to see that, though, that the, that the conclusions were about the supply side. In other words, if you see erratic behavior uh, stemming from some monetary cause, and you know that the demand for money is relatively stable, then where must be the instability? Namely, on the supply side. So it's a supply of money that causes the problem. So. All of, the, all of the empirical focus on the demand for money uh, had the effect of focusing attention on the supply of money as a source uh, of the instability uh, in the economy. And uh, there's, there are two things came out of this. Uh, one was it, it was counter to Keynes, because Keynes thought that there was instability in the demand for money. That, that's, that's the nature of his notion of a fetish of liquidity or a propensity to hoard money, the building up of... Uh, cash hoards or the drawing down of cash hoards, uh, a demand for money that uh, flops around. If you draw an ISLM curve, the demand for money is unstable. It can flop around quite a little bit. And Friedman was there with the evidence to say, it's not so, Keynes. It's not so. The evidence doesn't bear you out. Okay? The demand for money is stable. If there are problems on the supply side, that's, that's the central bank, and it's not a market problem, it's a policy problem with the central bank. And to that we can credit Friedman. I think that uh, he, he, more than anybody else, uh, shifted the attention uh, away from so-called uh, fetishistic behavior with regards to holding money to uh, politically oriented behavior with regard to supplying money. Okay? It's an important shift and one we should all uh, welcome. Uh, he also, using the same uh, empirical studies, uh, gave support to the proposition, probably the most famous quote from uh, Friedman, uh, that uh, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And, and that comes from the fact of, of investigating the other possible source, which would be changes in the demand for money, and showing that it didn't change. Okay, it doesn't change much. And so... The inflation doesn't come from people dishoarding money. It comes from the central bank supplying money. Uh, now, it's, it's just a short distance from this uh, observation or this empirically demonstrated truth. Maybe before I leave this slide, I should point out that in earlier lectures, 
uh, I've been critical about this notion of keeping the price level constant. Now let's go to the next slide. Yeah, oh, I just got Friedman's monetary rule. Uh, his rule is uh, increase the money supply at a slow and steady rate so as to achieve long-run price level constancy. In other words, if V is trending upward slightly and Q is trending upward slightly, well, okay, then uh, let uh, M uh, trend upward a little uh, uh, in order to keep the price level uh, constant. Okay, just offset whatever differential effect there is relative to V and, and Q. Uh, and and uh, a, a few lectures ago, I was critical of that in, in, in that uh, increasing the money supply to keep the price level constant uh, still gives you problems because you're increasing it by pumping money out through credit market, lowering the interest rate, and, and giving rise to a business cycle. Uh, so I'll, I'll mention that, but that's not what my uh, focus is uh, here this morning. So that's Friedman's uh, monetary rule. Now, uh, to implement this rule, to implement this rule, uh, it requires uh, a, a pretty definite definition of money. What does constitute money? Uh, and let me see where I go from here. I might not want to go to the next slide yet. No, I don't. I'll just leave that there for a minute. Uh, in the heyday of monetarism, and this would be during the 60s and uh, into the 70s, uh, a time when the velocity of money was in fact pretty stable with a slight upward trend, uh, money was well defined, and and uh, during the period, uh, people tend to overlook just why it was well defined. But it turned out to be a very important uh, consideration uh, during that period. In fact, uh, dating uh, clear back from the 30s and the monetary reforms that followed uh, the crash of 29, the Federal Reserve uh, uh, regulated. Uh, money and deposits of various kinds with a whole list of regulations that were identified by the letter. You had regulation A and regulation B and on down the line. And there was one regulation down there called regulation Q. They had a lot of regulations. <laughs> Reg Q. Reg Q. Uh, regulation Q that, that uh, pretty much hamstrung financial institutions in, into uh, offering particular kinds of deposits and being careful not to blur the distinction between the kinds of deposits. And uh, the, what I have in mind here is, is that Regulation Q uh, specified really two things. One, one is that interest cannot be paid on demand deposits. Okay, it was illegal to pay interest on demand deposits. And the other side of that coin, uh, which really is another way of saying the same thing, is that savings deposits, which do draw interest, uh, cannot be checkable deposits. Okay, so so you can you can have deposits which you can draw interest on and write checks on, but you can't draw interest and write checks on the same deposit. Right? You have to have one deposit you write checks on, another deposit you draw interest on. Right? And that was a pretty hard and fast rule. It applied to commercial banks and, and to all other lending institutions. They weren't allowed to have checkable deposits at all, so you couldn't have a checkable deposit at savings and loan or uh, savings bank or any anything other than uh, commercial bank chartered by the state or the federal government. Okay, so that regulation then uh, gave us a hard and fast distinction between what's money and what's not. Okay, what what money is that stuff you can write checks on, and what's not is that other stuff that you can't write checks on only you can draw uh, uh, interest on. Right? So you have that sort of black and white kink in the curve uh, 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 distinction between the different kinds of deposits. And that's what gave us that crisp definition of the money supply. In fact, uh, that, that definition was called M1. It, it included those checkable accounts, how much checking account money is there in the economy, uh, plus uh, currency and pocket change and, and so on. So you add those things up and you have money, meaning M1, okay, or it was called M1. That was money and anything beyond that, savings accounts or uh, time deposits of different kinds or bonds or whatever, that's not money, right? Uh, it is critical that, that that distinction be maintained. Uh, and so with, with a well-behaved velocity and a well-defined money supply, then at least it was possible to choose a monetary rule and implement it and stick with it. And uh, 
I have no doubt that the economy would have performed better had that rule been adhered to than uh, had it been flouted and instead uh, had manipulation of one sort or another, interest rates and discretionary monetary policy of one sort or another, the whole battle between rules versus discretion, the debates between Friedman and Heller and so on. Uh, I think all of us could have easily come down on the side of Friedman uh, in, those, in those debates. Of course, Heller was the Keynesian, so <laughs> it wasn't hard to choose. There wasn't any Austrian uh, in the debate. Uh, but things have changed. Things have changed, and we can, we can date the change to uh, the early 80s. Uh, let me show you a plot of velocity. Uh, and I take my plot, so you don't think I've rigged the statistics somehow, I take it from Brad Long, uh, published an article in Journal of Economic Perspectives a few years ago. If I plotted my own uh, curve, which matches his, and if you keep going, the curve keeps doing jig-jag things into the future, so it doesn't change the, the pattern. But what you can see on this curve is look at the heyday of monetarism. Uh, the, here's the 60s and 70s, and sure enough, there's velocity uh, which is the darker line, okay, the actual, the purple line shows you sort of the general trend, okay, and, and uh, all of those empirical studies uh, showed that velocity didn't much deviate from that trend, okay, that was the whole idea, velocity doesn't change much apart from the upward trend, which is exaggerated here, uh, just to get the scale, uh, give you a visible visual illustration of what's going on, but then something happened uh, in the early 80s. There's 1980 right there. Something happened here to cause velocity to start performing erratically. Uh, and uh, it, it won't do to say, oh, we have a new trend and it's more horizontal because uh, that curve isn't very close to any trend line, is it? Sometimes way above it, sometimes way below it, and so on. It's, it's, it's not close enough to have policy relevance as being overall constant, okay? It's not a zigzag up, first up and down, and so on. So well, what happened in this uh, early 80s period, or late 70s, early 80s? And what happened was the phasing out and elimination of Regulation Q, okay? Uh, Regulation Q uh, gave rise to some uh, interesting uh, incentives uh, in the late 70s, uh, where uh, market rates of interest were very high, and uh, banks were constrained on what interest they could pay on savings accounts and so on. And so there emerged uh, uh, markets from money market mutual funds and certificates of deposits and all sorts of things to, to skirt around those regulations. Uh, and eventually the uh, government recognized that uh, the regulations weren't being complied with anyhow, so they, they eliminated Regulation Q. So now banks could pay, check, pay interest on checking accounts, they could allow you to write checks on savings accounts, and the distinction was gone. The crisp de definition was gone. Uh, if we still, we still record the data on M1, but if you look at the M1 velocity of money, which is plotted here, it's very erratic. So the, the whole empirical basis on which monetarism was based is gone, okay? It's gone, uh, which I've called the uh, irony of monetarism. I think I put that on the screen. Okay, velocity of money became unstable after 1980. That phasing out of Reg Q was actually initiated under the Carter administration and then accelerated under the Reagan administration. So Friedman's policy lost its velocity anchor. Federal Reserve abandoned money supply targeting in favor of interest rate targeting. Right, so now all the time when you hear about Greenspan and his policy, what's he likely to do next? Uh, you never hear about what, what money growth rule is he likely to adopt or what money growth rate is he likely to target. You don't hear that. That would be a monetarist rule or a monetarist uh, kind of a policy. What you hear instead is what interest rate <laughs> that, uh, that he's going to target and what uh, discount rate he's going to set. Okay? So the, the policy since uh, actually before Greenspan uh, took office is all uh, interest rate targeting. Right? Uh, and uh, you can see where interest rate is in that equation, right? It's not there. It's not there. So what, what's, the, what's the monetarist framework going to do with analyzing changes in interest rates in a framework that doesn't include the interest rates? 
what I've called the, uh, the irony of monetarism, and I really don't see this anywhere else. I, it's, it's my turn to call it the irony, but I don't even see the, the, the proposition uh, anywhere else. Uh, the monetary rule that allows the economy to perform at its laissez-faire best, according to the monitors, presupposes a critical piece of intervention, okay? <laughs> namely regulation Q, <laughs> that makes the money supply operationally definable and makes the velocity relatively stable, all right? Uh, so that's, that's, that is sort of a, uh, an irony. So if he, if he loses that piece of uh, intervention, uh, no longer can even prescribe a monetary rule, uh, let alone follow it. Uh, and uh, monetarists uh, were slow to recognize this, that uh, all during the uh, early part of Greenspan's uh, term, many terms, uh, monetarists were always critical that he wasn't following monetary rules. And uh, there were monetarists on the uh, staff of the joint of the JEC. What is that council or the Joint Economic Committee, uh, the House and Senate, uh, the committee that uh, uh, that has Greenspan testify uh, periodically and ask him questions about why is he doing this or why is he not doing that. And one of the questions. Uh, Oh, probably within a couple of years after Greenspan uh, took office, uh, one of the questions was, uh, why aren't you following a monetary rule? Why aren't you at least paying attention to the growth rate of the money supply uh, rather than targeting interest rates? And uh, Greenspan's answer was very, uh, very interesting and very revealing. I think I've got it on the screen next. Uh, Greenspan says, we don't know what money is anymore, okay? Uh, which, which in the context of my lecture, you know what he means. That it, what's, what's the right definition of the money supply? It can't be M1. That, that thing is just kind of gone silly. And what is it? Is it M2, M3? At one point, they had the M's defined up to M13, uh, after which they started using letter designations. There's something called MZM that uh, the St. Louis Fed keeps track of, but which, which one do you look at? Even during the heyday of monetarism, we had all of these different M's, but they all tend to move up and down together. It didn't, it didn't really matter which one uh, you target. Uh, but uh, after deregulation in the 1980s, then it, the M's move at odd angles to one another. Some go up, some go down, they go up and down at different rates and so on. And, if you want to watch the money supply, which one do you watch? And that's, this is uh, Greenspan's point. That we don't know which one to watch anymore. don't know what money is anymore. But the way he said it, here you had the chairman of the Federal Reserve who doesn't know what money is anymore. And it's a line that got quoted even by Jay Leno on The Tonight Show. You know, we're wondering if we've got the right guy at this job. You know, <laughs> at least we've got somebody who knows what money is. Okay. <laughs> But it explains why the Federal Reserve then switched from money supply targeting to interest rate targeting uh, in the early 80s. Uh, but note here uh, that Q in MB equal PQ, Q literally quantity, but, but real output, the quantity of output, level of output of what? Well, of everything. Okay? It's, it's, it's a real gross domestic product uh, called final output of all consumer goods, investment goods, and the economy. So. In other words, it lumps together both consumption and investment. I've written it here as Q sub C plus Q sub I because it's quantity terms and not, and not uh, expenditure magnitudes. Uh, so uh, the division between consumption and investment uh, is, is glossed over. It's eclipsed. Those two things have been put together and just called Q. And yet we're trying to analyze what's going on uh, as the interest rate changes, which is now what the Federal Reserve uses because they can't use the money supply anymore. So with the effect of interest rate changes on relative movements in C and I, uh, and certainly on the pattern of investment, is, is just no part of the theory. It can't be because C and I have been, have been smashed together into a single aggregate called Q, all right? Uh, sometimes uh, I like to make the point in comparing all three, this Keynesianism, monetarism, and Austrianism, that what we see is that the Keynesians have a level of aggregation, C and I, that at least allows them to see a problem. 
Okay, there's a problem in the economy. C needs to get coordinated with I, and yet it isn't, because it's driven by animal spirits and habits and so on. Uh, there's two ways to go there. You could either increase the level of aggregation and get rid of the problem, you know, where you can't see the problem either. Okay? And that's what the monitors do, or you could decrease the level of aggregation, like Hayek does in multiple stages of production, where you can see the market forces that can solve the problem. All right? So Friedman is operating at a higher level of aggregation even to the, than the Keynesians, and in effect putting into eclipse the very issues that divide the Keynesians from the Austrians. He just calls it Q. Okay. Now, uh, just in terms of monetary theory, it's hard to press much beyond where I've already gone. I've got MV equal PQ. That's, that's really the whole story. That's the basis of the story. And so when Friedman particularly, and monetarists in general, began telling stories about what must be going on in the economy uh, while this uh, economy is adjusting to an increase in the money supply, uh, what can they talk about? Uh, they, don't, they don't have a level of aggregation that allows them to focus in on anything. And they end up uh, uh, talking about labor markets and distortions in labor markets that are based on faulty perceptions of uh, inflation. And so in, instead of having a monetary theory here, it's not really monetary theory at all. It's a theory of labor market dynamics, sort of a unique particular theory of labor market dynamics. How, how could labor markets be working in such a way to give us the, the kind of results that we seem to observe? And that's where I want to go next, a theory of labor market dynamics. One of the few monetarists that, uh, that points this out is uh, David Laidler, uh, who I mentioned the other day the other day as a Canadian monetarist, that uh, he's a little bit critical of Friedman's monetarism for this very reason. He says, well, this is not really monetary theory, it's theory of labor market dynamics, and it might stand or fall on that basis, but, but uh, that's what the theory is. So let's see if I can explain this uh, theory of labor market uh, dynamics. Uh, it goes like this. Uh, we have inflation uh, of the money supply. In other words, the, the Fed increases the money supply. Now, in, in uh, recent times, what we would say is the, is the Fed targets a low rate of interest because they're interest rate targeting. But how do they target the low rate of interest? By pumping money into the credit markets until they've driven them down that much. Okay, so, so you get the increase in the money supply. They're just not keeping tabs on what that increase is, pumping enough in so to get the interest rate where they want it to be. Okay, so pump in money, get the interest rate down. Of course, that causes inflation, starts increasing prices, and so on. Uh, so prices create a discrepancy between perceived wages, wages as perceived by the employer and wages as in C, perceived by the employee. Let's see how that works. Okay, the real wage rate as perceived by the employer and the real wage rate as, see, as perceived by the employee. And it's not that one or the other is just better at perceiving things. That's not it. Okay. Friedman makes it clear that here's what's going on. The uh, individual uh, producer is producing, say, one product. He's producing widgets or whatever it is. And he can't help but notice that the price he can get for his widgets, widgets is higher. There's no perception problem here, is there? <laughs> if you can get more for it, fine. You're happy about it. You sell your widgets at a higher price. And you see that. Uh, but nothing yet has happened to uh, the wage rate. And so the wage rate is lower in real terms. In other words, compared to what you can get for widgets. The wage rate's lower. All right? So he just sees that, well, okay, at a lower wage rate, I'll hire more workers. Okay? And he might hire more workers even if he has to bid up the nominal wage rate just because if he doesn't bid it up as far as the price of widgets, he's still getting a good deal, isn't he? So he might bid up the nominal wage rate a little bit to hire more workers and still be making out quite well because he's selling widgets at a higher price. Right? So from the employer's point of view, from the employer's point of view, he's just moving down along that demand curve for labor. He wants more labor because it's cheaper in terms of what he's producing, namely the widgets. All right? Now, uh, okay, there it is. The employer sees the wage rate falling with respect to output prices. But now let's look at the employee. What does he see? Uh, he sees, but only belatedly, 
the falling real wage. So the first thing the, the employee sees is that he's getting a higher nominal wage. All right? And, and he mistakes that for a higher real wage. Uh, because he's got a lot more things to look at than widgets. In fact, he might not even buy any widgets uh, or care about what the price of those things are. But he buys a whole basket of consumer goods, some of whose prices are going up, some of whose prices are going down. And it's beyond him what the average of prices is. You, nobody, including the employer, can perceive that very quickly to see the change in those, in those uh, average prices of, of all those goods. So from the employee standpoint, it looks to him like the real wage has risen. Because the nominal wage has risen, risen and he hasn't yet caught on to the fact that prices in general are rising. Okay? So let's see. So initially, employee sees a rising real wage. Okay? So now with the arrows there, I show there's the real wage in the employer's view, and there's the real wage in the employee's view. So you have sort of a double disequilibrium depending on these two different uh, perceptions. But uh, in just setting it out that way, you see it's not going to last. It's going to be temporary. Uh, and you can also see, though, that, that, that in both cases, the quantity of labor supplied is, has increased. Okay, so you get more people working. The employer, because he thinks he's getting wages cheaper, and the employee, because he thinks he's getting wages uh, higher. Okay, so that's the, that's the nature of the boom. So what, what I want you to see here is that there's a boom-bust story being told. Yeah, yeah, you get a boom and a bust, and the boom comes from this misperception, sort of a double misperception of the real wage, uh, and, and it eventually comes undone because eventually workers straighten out their perceptions about what the real wage is. And once they discover that they can't buy even as much now as they used to, then there's a, a, a reaction to that. You get back to the old supply and demand for labor. You get some people maybe that were bid into the labor force as secondary workers in the household because it looked like a good deal. Now, it's not such a good deal, so they, they uh, uh, resume their role in the household rather than in the labor force. Or on the other hand, uh, you'll get... Uh, at, at uh, wage negotiation time, people negotiating for cost of living uh, increases to uh, fix the problem that, uh, uh, that they now uh, finally perceive, namely that the average prices of goods and services are going up. Okay. So it all comes undone. Uh, let's see. Oh, I'll point out it, 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 with this slide that, that, that there's something strange about the whole thing in that isn't it odd that the notable effects of an increase in the money supply impinge, in the first instance, on labor markets. Now, isn't it odd? Because the, money, the new money comes in through credit markets and initially impinges on the interest rate. But where's that in this theory? It's nowhere in the theory. Okay? It's not there. It's nowhere, no part of it. So the money supply comes through credit markets, impinges on the interest rates, eventually bids up prices, which affect differentially the perception of the real wage. And that is what causes the boom, according to Friedman. Right? So it's, it's a very contorted theory, very constrained, a very strained theory, uh, just in its own right. Uh, and then probably as telling or more telling, it should be more telling to the uh, monitors. It doesn't line up with the data. Uh, and, and this should be more of a, a critique of monetarism from their point of view <laughs> than it is from, uh, from my own. But uh, the theory implies that, that the real wages are actually low during the boom. Okay? Because the, the, per, the perception on the, on the part of the employees is a misperception. Right? The employer, he's actually, he's, what he's seeing is actually there. In other words, he's selling real widgets for a high price, and he's buying labor at a lower price, and he's making a bigger profit. That's all real stuff, okay? But, and so the real wages are low during the boom. And the worker finally figures this out, and that's what gives you the bust. And so one empirical test is to say, well, are real wages generally low during economic booms? And of course the answer is no. Real wages tend to be high during economic booms. And in fact, if they weren't, uh, creating artificial booms wouldn't be nearly as politically popular as it actually is. <laughs> it does, it's not hard to see that, that, that the reason that, that the booms are generated are precisely 
to make people uh, do better, if only temporarily, than, than they otherwise would have. So uh, it's at, at, at odds with the empirical uh, record. Uh, and then here is a piece of analysis that uh, most of you will recognize as short-run, long-run Phillips curve analysis. Uh, A.W. Phillips showed an empirical relationship between inflation rate and the unemployment rate, and those things appear to be trade-offs one, one against the other. And that downward sloping curve is a short-run Phillips curve, meaning that there's to some extent you can trade unemployment for inflation or inflation for unemployment. And, uh, and, and in fact, this uh, labor market dynamics was devised to show how that trade-off gets made. That uh, starting at this point, where you have actually some inflation already, uh, there's an increase in the money supply, and workers misperceive uh, the increase in the nominal wage as an increase in the real wage, and so they work more, uh, and that reduces unemployment. So that business of more people working is just a reduction in unemployment, so a movement leftward. But inflation is underway, prices are going up, and, and the economy moves in this direction until workers eventually straighten out their perceptions of the real wage. Then some leave the labor market, others demand uh, cost of living adjustments and so on. And uh, the uh, economy returns to a point now with higher inflation, but with the same level of, of uh, employment and, and no misperceptions. Okay, so that's the dynamic. The labor market dynamics will trace out that particular path uh, and uh, put us on a, a point on the long run Phillips curve, which is vertical. This is one of Friedman's contributions to show that the long run Phillips curve, in other words, after misperceptions have been straightened out, uh, is not downward slope, is vertical is vertical. So in the long run, there's no trade-off between inflation and unemployment. And that's, a, that's a, 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 a pretty good view if the alternative is uh, the Phillips curve itself and the supposed uh, permanent trade-off between those two. It doesn't exist. And the Friedman showed that that was his famous 1967 uh, address at the American Economic Association meetings. Uh, note here, though, that the way I've shown it, I've shown you moving up of Phillips curve looks like both uh, prices and employment are moving at the same time. And in fact, uh, to make the story stick, you would have to have inflation first. In other words, you have to have inflation for the wage rate to be misperceived to give you the lower unemployment. Isn't that right? I mean, that's, that's the story. You know, the first there has to be inflation, then you misperceive it, and then... Uh, you get the lower rate of employment. Uh, okay, let's see a summary here. In, in response to an increase in the money supply, the economy moves up the short-run Phillips curve, but the curve itself shifts as workers straighten out their perceptions of the real wage. The long-run Phillips curve is vertical. Okay. Uh, now let's look at that equation of exchange again and see what sense we can make out of it. And here I, can, here I think I can reconcile in the direction of the Austrians. Uh, Q rises to the extent that P rises. Isn't that the story? In other words, why, why is Q rising at all? Well, because the more people are working, making things. Why are they making things? Well, because they're misperceiving an ongoing inflation. Well, the ongoing inflation has to get ongoing before they can misperceive it and then go to work and produce things. Isn't that right? So the, the logic of the system has prices rising first and causing output uh, to be dragged along behind it. But if you look at MV equal PQ, you see, and you see on this side of the equation, P times Q, uh, it's pretty clear that if M goes up, some combination of P and Q has to go up. And can't you say that one goes up to the extent the other doesn't? In other words, if it's only P, then Q can't rise. Or if it's only Q, then P can't rise. Right? So, so in that sense, it's hard to make the case that Q goes up to the extent that P goes up. But quite to the contrary, Q goes up to the extent that P doesn't go up. In fact, one of the fundamental propositions of monetarism, and here's a direct contradiction within the school itself, as set out by Friedman, is that in the initial stages of a monetary expansion, Q rises first with prices hardly moving at all. Well, I think that's empirically correct. But if it's correct, then you can't really explain that rise in Q by some misperception of inflation which hasn't yet occurred. Okay? 
So the, the timing is a little faulty there. Uh, so Q rises to the extent that P does not rise, and initially P doesn't rise at all, and so Q goes up. Okay, the two claims together, though, and here's my reconciliation, the Q, two claims together suggest a self-reversing process. Okay, there's a boom-bust story being told here. It's being told in terms of labor market dynamics, which I think is not the best setting to tell the story, but here it is. So in the face of an increased money supply, Q rises, as does P. So you got Q rising, and Q even rising first, uh, but P starting to rise too. But then Q falls to its initial level as P becomes fully adjusted to the higher M. So you can, you can see that uh, self-reversing process. Look, here's P and here's Q. So what happens? Q starts rising. P rises too. If there's misperception, it gives a boost to Q. But Q will fall back down to its original level after P has become fully adjusted to the money supply. That gives you the boom and the bust as the price level is adjusting to that new money supply, okay? And that can be a significant boom and bust if it really takes 18 to 30 months for P to rise all the way up to that uh, subsequent level, doesn't it? You've got 18 months to play with. That's the, that's the political uh, time to play with to, to get the boom until the bust comes. Uh, okay. Now I'm going to throw another framework at you that some of you may not recognize, but uh, I'll, I'll explain it uh, very briefly. And it's kind of like, you know, the monetarists deal with these issues seriatim, one at a time. In, in the Phillips curve theory, the interest rate is out of play. It's just nowhere in sight, and it's, it's not to be factored in at all, period. But what does change is the level of employment, first rising and then falling due to these misperceptions. Is there no theory that the, that the monetarists offer that involve a change in the interest rate? Well, yes, there is, but, but in that theory... The assumption is that the level of output remains constant throughout the whole adjustment. <laughs> okay, uh, so this is a, a model offered by Don Patinkin, and uh, he does it in terms of the interest rate. So he finally we've got the interest rate in the picture and the price level. So you've got the price level in the picture and the curves that you've shown there, and neither of which I'll explain in full, except to say, CC curve is a, is the demand for, or, or is the commodities curve, commodity just being output, commodities, all kind of commodities, consumption goods, investment goods, and so on. And BB curve, is, that's bonds, which, which broadly stands for earning assets, investment goods, and so on, financial assets, bonds, and so on. Uh, and each curve then represents combinations of prices and interest that keeps bonds on the one hand or commodities on the other hand in equilibrium. Now we can gloss over that. Uh, because the, the key to this model is that it's a model that shows an initial equilibrium back here when those two curves used to intersect at that point, and then an increase in the money supply that brings forth an adjustment of prices to a higher level. And here we've got a half a P and P, and what we're assuming is that the money supply doubles and that eventually prices double from a half a P to P which is thoroughly consistent, of course, with uh, MV equal PQ. You get that right out of MV equal PQ. And the only additional thing you get here is that if you trace out the dynamics, and this is directly from Patinkin, I'm not, I'm not adding it to the figure, it's directly from Patinkin. If you trace out the dynamics, uh, the interest rate falls during the adjustment period, but rises to its original level once the equilibrium has uh, been struck, and I, and I can show you, let's look at it. In response to an increase in the money supply, prices are bid up as people try to purchase more output. Well, that explains why prices are rising, going to the right here, because prices are on the horizontal axis, okay? But with no more output to purchase, and this is, this is based on an assumed constancy of output, all right? So you're not having more labor working, or you're not having more output produced. Uh, you really can't have a boom-bust here, can you? Because the output stays the same all the while. Where's, where's the boom? Uh, so with no more output to purchase, people buy bonds instead. In other words, they're trying to buy commodities because they've got more money, but there aren't any more commodities. And they don't want to hold all this money, so, well, okay, buy earning assets, buy bonds. But when you buy bonds, you put down pressure on interest rates. Bond prices rise, interest rates fall. Isn't that right? Bond prices rise, interest rates fall. Uh, and, and that's what puts downward pressure on the interest rate. However, once you finally bid up 
prices of goods and services to fully adjust to the money supply, uh, you no longer have this uh, spillover demand for bonds and the interest rate demand for bonds and the interest rate returns to its original level. All right. Uh, so with no more output to purchase, people buy bonds instead, driving the interest rate below its equilibrium level. In the long run, the prices fully adjust to the higher money supply and the interest rate returns to its initial level. Right? So if, if in the monetary framework you assume a constant output, then the temporary change is strictly in terms of interest rates. But it has no effect. What, what effect could it possibly have in this model? Because output isn't changing, and you're not differentiating between consumption output and investment output, and certainly not differentiating among the various stages of production. So the interest rate has no effect, even though it's lower. Uh, so according to Patinkin, Q remains at its full employment level during the adjustment of price level and the interest rate. More specifically, the interest rate falls and then rises as price level becomes fully adjusted to the higher money supply. Note the interest rate is low for a period of 18 to 30 months without there being any effect on the makeup of output. Isn't that just implausible? Okay. Now, what I argue in, in uh, time and money, let's see, well, let's do, uh, let's do the contrast verbally and then I'll show you the graphics. Okay. So you've got two alternative constructions here. One the level of employment rises and then falls as the economy adjusts to an increase in the money supply, but the rate of interest remains out of play. Okay? Then in the other construction, the rate of interest falls and then rises as the economy adjusts to an increase in the money supply, but the economy remains at its full employment level throughout the adjustment. <laughs> okay. So all you have to do is, is put the two together, you see. Look at it. Look at it closely. You got some point during the period here where unemployment rate is low, maybe the 3.9 percent that was achieved by Clinton uh, during the 90s. Okay, unemployment rate is low, but there's no interest rate having any effect. If you look at the next one, you've got one point during the period, uh, low point, where the interest rate is low, but no effect on uh, employment or output. Okay. Now, if you put these two together, okay, uh, you wonder if, if if I go back here. They take this low point, low rate of interest here, that that would uh, correspond to that low rate of unemployment, which is a high rate of output. Wouldn't you think it would affect the kind of output that got placed, the, the division between consumption and investment, and the pattern of investment? You have to put these two curves uh, together. Okay, see, so somehow if you see it like this, you know you'll, you'll get the <laughs> you'll get the Austrian view. Okay. Uh, suppose each is half right. That's the way I like to do it. Suppose each is half right. And the rate of interest falls and then rises as the economy adjusts to an increase in money supply, while at the same time the level of employment rises and then falls. Okay? Whoop, missed that. Wouldn't the increase in labor input be allocated intertemporally in accordance with the relatively low rate of interest? Of course it would. Okay? And if it would, then you're going to get an Austrian story instead of a monitor story. Now, I've searched around in Friedman to find some, some hint that he recognizes this. And sure enough, uh, the article I was able to find, uh, we'll read through this in a second, but let me just explain. He wrote this article, uh, The Lag Effect in the Monetary Policy. Okay, and this is in Milton Friedman's Optimum Quantity. And it's a fairly short article, but what he's trying to account for is that lag. You remember at the beginning I said, well, why, why would it take so long, 18 to 30 months, for prices to adjust to the new money supply? It seems like a, he calls it a long and variable lag. Why should it be so long in a monetarist framework? What would he explain that? And Friedman is trying to explain that. And, and tellingly, he's not explaining it in terms of labor. He's explaining it in terms of capital. And here I have about two and a half screens, but it's worth reading because it, it, because it really shows you how close he is to an Austrian view when he actually considers the reason for the length of the lag. Uh, holders of cash, he says, will bid up the price of assets. If the extra demand is initially directed at a particular class of assets, say government securities or commercial paper or the like, the result will be to pull the prices of such assets out of line with other assets and thus widen the area into which the extra cash spills. 
The increased demand will spread sooner or later, affecting, look, equities, houses, durable producer goods, durable consumer goods, and so on, though not necessarily in that order. These effects can be described as operating on interest rates, he says. If a more cosmopolitan, of course he means Austrian, <laughs> interpretation of interest rate is adopted rather than the usual one, which refers to a small range of marketable security. So he's talking about assets. He didn't, he didn't think in terms of a capital structure. But when he says assets and he says durable producer goods, you know, that's, that's where uh, the new money is going. Now look at this. Uh, he's thinking in terms of Frank Knight's theory of capital. Instead of having a structure of production that produces output, you've got a source called capitalist producing a flow called consumable output. Okay? The key feature of this process during which the interest rates are low is that it tends to raise the price of sources, that's capital, of both producer and consumer services relative to the prices of the services themselves. It is therefore encourages the production of such sources and at the same time the direct acqu uh, acquisition of the services. That's, that's Friedman's malinvestment and overconsumption, okay, rather than of the source. But these reactions in their turn tend to raise the prices of the services, you know, the forced savings, relative to the prices of the sources, that is to undo the initial effect of the interest rate. There is a self-reversing aspect. The final result may be a rise in expenditures in all directions without any change in the interest rate at all. Interest rates and asset prices may simply be the conduit through which the effect of monetary changes is transmitted to expenditures without altering it at all. So he ends up emphasizing the interest rate is right back where it used to be at the end of the process. Well, fine. Uh, uh, it may or may not be right back where it used to be, but it'll be close. The point is that it was low during the 18 to 30 months, and, and that's what gave rise to the sorts of distortions he's talking about. One more half screen full, and it, it really drives the point home. Look at what he says. He says, it may be that the monetary expansion induces someone within two or three months to contemplate building a factory within four or five, that should be F-O-U-R, or five, to draw up plans Within six or seven to get construction started, the actual construction may take another six months, and much of the effect on the income stream may come still later, insofar as initial goods used in construction are withdrawn from inventories and only subsequently lead to an increased expenditure by suppliers. So if you look at that, that's, that's, that's the, the pure uh, uh, Austrian view. Uh, so now here's another oddity of, of Friedman. Uh, if you put some of these things together, see, the only really boom-bust story he has is the Phillips curve thing, okay, the misperception of wages. The Patinkin thing is not really boom-bust because it doesn't have the uh, quantity varying. But, so let's go to the boom-bust, the, the Phillips curve thing. So he's saying that, that the dynamics, what's going on is this misperception of wages. But now why does it take so long for workers to straighten out their perceptions of the wages? Well, he, sh he shifts all together and talks about capital and, and the effect of interest in a cosmopolitan sense and, and justifies in the end ignoring the interest rate only because at the end of the process it's back to where it started. Okay, so oh, that's just a trans, transitional matter. Okay. And yet if that explains the lag then surely that has to be the theory of the process and not some misperception on the part of workers. Okay, now what I like to do you'll recognize that I think it kind of looks like my uh, model in time and money. In fact, this is, is from time and money. But what I'm showing here is that if you do the whole thing in terms of labor market misperceptions, then you get those misperceptions both in the early stages and the late stages. You get uh, increased output in all stages. You get the economy pushed beyond the PPF, uh, but without any particular bias in terms of investment, uh, because that's not part of the model. And then when those misperceptions are straightened out, uh, the economy goes back to its initial uh, position. Okay, and yet, if you factor in, if you factor in uh, all of this discussion about why the lag is so long and what kind of things must be going on during the lag, of course, you morph from there to there. You get the old boom bust, like uh, the Austrians suggested. Uh, now, I can't. Uh, resist saying a little thing about, a little bit about uh, Friedman's plucking model, because this is a special story that actually emerges out of uh, 
some early activities of the Mises Institute. It's kind of fun. Uh, years ago, when the Review of Austrian Economics was just starting, uh, Walter Block uh, was an editor. Along with, he was a co-editor along with Murray Rothbard. And uh, Block had a certain strategy uh, for getting the, Aust the Review of Austrian Economics off the ground. Uh, and uh, you, you think what you will about the strategy, but here it was. It's, it's invite people that know something about the Austrian school, whether they're critical of it or uh, whatever. Uh, invite them as long as they're well-known people, big-name people. Invite them to write something about uh, the Austrian view, why they reject it, and then get somebody else in the Austrian movement to counter that article. Okay, that was a strategy. It's a Blockian strategy. I mean, what can you say? <laughs> <laughs> Only Block would. Uh, and so he and, and, and so he wrote Friedman, and he said, "Would you uh, would you write uh, your criticisms of the Austrian theory of the trade cycle?" And Friedman wrote back, and he said, no, I'm not going to address that issue again. I've already addressed it, and I have no more to say. Well, Bloch, being tenacious, uh, writes back, oh, I'm sorry, I must have missed. <laughs> <laughs> must have missed where you criticized. And uh, Friedman responded again. He said, oh, well, it was in an article uh, written in, I think, 64, uh, where uh, it was... Uh, progress report of studies going on in the NBER. And uh, Friedman obviously had gone back and checked this report now. And he said, it wasn't quite as I reported. He says, I didn't, uh, I didn't mention the Austrian school. I didn't m mention Mises or Hayek by name. But I thought you people would know who you are. You know, you'd recognize you're being criticized. Uh, and so Black uh, bundled up the correspondence and sent it to me. And I went back and dug up the report to see what Friedman had said. And in that report, it's an amazing report because he says uh, that if you look at the data, he says you really don't see booms and busts. Uh, there are no boom-bust cycles. Uh, what there are are bust-boom cycles. You see the economy lapsing from, a, uh, from secular growth and then recovery. Bust-boom. So... It's not that the Austrians are so much wrong, they're irrelevant. They're trying to explain boom-bust cycles when there aren't any. There are bust-boom cycles. Uh, again, it's in a category of proves too much, because what about Friedman's own long-run, short-run Phillips curve story? That's a boom-bust cycle. Did he mention that, by the way, there it goes too? Well, it, he actually offered that theory a few years later than, than uh, throwing out wholesale all of the boom-bust theorizing. And so uh, he introduced in that little report uh, what he called a plucking model, which, which requires some explanation. Uh, let me show you a picture of the plucking model. Only I, I draw the picture of it. Uh, Friedman just talks you through it. He says you have secular growth in the economy. That's, that's the long-term trend there. And he says, unfortunately, the, the economy doesn't always stay on track. Some, sometimes it's plucked loose from trend. And so he, he asked you to imagine a string glued to the underbelly of this plank. And a string, it has to be sort of a taffy-like string, is plucked down at various increments to very extent. And he says, that's the pattern of output you see. So you see bust and then boom. It's really, it's really bust and then recovery, isn't it, to trend. So, and so he says, according to those Austrians, well, actually, he doesn't, he doesn't mention Austrians. According to some, who see a correlation between the size of the downturn and the size of the upturn, they're just not looking at the data. Because look, he says, uh, here's here's the upturn, kind of a mediocre upturn, and then here's the downturn is pretty severe. Then here's a big upturn, and then a little downturn. Okay, they say people looking at for boom bust theories think they can explain that bust in terms of that boom, or that bust in terms of that boom. They can't do it because there's no correlation, all right? And that's his plucking model. Uh, I actually wrote something in a short article uh, commenting on this, but then in later years, I realize I'm short of time, but I'll, I'll finish this up very quickly. Uh, on Friedman's 80th birthday uh, the, at the Western meetings, uh, they invited him to present a, play, a paper which would be published uh, in the uh, Economic Inquiry. 
uh, on monetary theory. Well, at that time, he hadn't dealt with monetary theory for years. But he had dealt with Bloch. Okay? <laughs> and so, for the purpose, for the purpose of that uh, presentation, he took that section out of his old report and presented it almost verbatim. One of the few changes is that in about the end of the second paragraph, he writes, Mises and Hayek are prime examples here. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and it came out as a lead article in 1993 in Economic Inquiry. Well, when that happened, you know, I sort of jumped up and clicked my heels to see Friedman now is you know, back in print afresh with his plucking model. And so I felt uh, uh, it was justifiable to put the plucking model in time and money and, and uh, deal with it. So it, it's a strange thing because now he's actually denying that there are such things as boom-bust cycles, and therefore we don't need a uh, theory of them. I think that's the end of it. Oh, well, there's Friedman. Okay, what can you say? <laughs> okay, thank you very much.